appreciate it, and welcome. Thanks for coming back. Those of you who weren't here before, welcome. And, uh, and let me say, we're not going to do a formal introduction of each of us. Uh, these folks have like incredibly impressive uh, bios. Uh, it probably make you want to breathe them, not just listen to them. So they're very uh, uh, accomplished. Uh, and I'm excited about this um, you know, panel. And, we, and it's about leadership, but with a bit of a loose focus. And I'll read you the introduction I wrote about that focus, just one paragraph. EWI obviously was started in large part on the premise of bringing, that bringing people together would create a more peaceful and sustainable world. Uh, I remember John saying to me once when he was talking about the board, and he said, you know, we have Republicans on the board, we have Democrats on the board, we have independents on the board, what we don't have are rockheads. He said, because if somebody is not willing to entertain a position different than theirs, then they're not of much use to me. He believed that divergent thinking was critical to the work of making peace, and we know it's critical to the work of organizational success. So our panel has a loose focus on leading through change and difference. How can we harness differences, bring differences together? Why does it matter to create that kind of divergent thinking, whether it's in society or in an organization, uh, and a lot of these, these panelists have a lot of experience doing that kind of work. So I'm going to start by just asking each of them to say a few words about why they think this is an important issue in leadership, around leading for divergence and, and difference and bringing people together, uh, and also one part of their own experience where they may have seen where that was particularly important. I didn't warn them they was going to do that, so don't, but, but they're all brilliant, so they'll, they'll, they'll accomplish it rightly. So in fairness, I'll let whoever wants to go first go, and then you can go in the order that, so who wants to volunteer to go first? I can. Yeah, please. Thank and you. introduce yourself and, sure. uh, as well. Um, can you hear me? Is it, it's on. Okay, yeah. great. Hi, everybody. Thanks, John. Hi. Um, Hello, Global Leadership Institute. Really happy to be here today. Um, I knew John Rose and, of course, very well know Karen. And so I was delighted when she asked me to come speak today. On this panel today on leading in divergence and why it's important, my perspective comes from the United States government. So after attending Georgetown Law School, I practiced law for a few years, and then I went into government, first in the United States Senate in the 90s working for a U.S. Senator from the state of Michigan. And then from there I went to work for President George W. Bush um, starting in 2001. And so what I know of leadership and executive management is coming from the U.S. government and it's coming from policy. Um, why it's important to lead from a divergent standpoint, at least, and I'm sorry to say, in my years, in the 90s, um, we had both Republicans and Democrats on the Hill actually accomplishing legislation and passing bills, even though during the time that I served, both the House and the Senate flipped in its, in its party affiliation. And we also, of course, had at the time a White House that was of an opposing party that, than, than the senator that I worked for. and very. Very few times do you see a House, a Senate, and a White House all of the same party. You know, it's there, but it's, it's very few. Um, and that's why, in order, I believe, for our democracy to work, even though you might have divergent ideas and parties, our, party, our, our country is pretty much a two-party system, Republicans and Democrats. Um, and it's important because that's how policy gets made. That's how, how and why in a very peaceful way. And I just, you know, from my personal experiences can recall in the early 90s, uh, George Mitchell was majority leader, Bob Dole was minority leader, and eventually that flipped, but there was a lot of cooperation that went on and a lot of legislation that passed. Um, I'm sorry to say that we are where we are today 
in a very divided political environment, and we're, I'm happy later on to go into why that is, but I think you all know why that is. And so it's become very difficult, very difficult to accomplish anything for our country through these divergent standpoints. Um, but I saw um, certainly within my service areas where, um, you know, where there was where there, where there was leadership and outcomes from that. I'll only leave it to just say, in the latest State of the Union address, I'm not sure if many of you tuned into that or if that's a very Washington inside thing, but President Biden gave the State of the Union at a, a different time this year, I think it was March 1st, when it's normally the end of January. Um, and the two biggest applause lines he got from both Republicans and Democrats, and by the way, in everything else, you know, the Republicans sat and the Democrats stood, or the Democrats sat while the Republicans stood. There were only two issues that they agreed upon. One was Ukraine and the horrible Russian invasion and war of Ukraine, where everybody agreed on that, and that's important during times of war. And the second issue was made in America, where both Republicans and Democrats could agree that actually going back to a policy of made in America helps not only our economy, but our country as a whole, and that it's a good thing for Americans. So with that, that is my initial opening comment. I hope that was helpful. Well, very helpful and, and so tempting to <laughs> dig in deeper, but we're gonna come back to some of the things you said for sure. Marcia, why don't you go next? Yeah, and, and I'm not an expert on macro level things at all. So my area of expertise is much more micro. And the idea of uh, appreciating divergent views is very central to what I do. So one of the things I'm gonna talk about later when we do our little session is feed forward. And the whole idea of feed forward is I teach everyone I coach to ask for input, to listen, to not talk and not argue, to thank people for the input and be open-minded. And so I really encourage them to learn from everyone around them. And over the COVID period, I had 60 people that my friend Mark Thompson and I worked with every weekend. And the rules were everyone could express questions and answers and say thank you. They didn't put anyone down or argue. And I'm a Buddhist, so this is based on Buddhist philosophy. Buddhists said only do what I teach if it works for you. If it doesn't work for you, it's okay, just don't do it. Yet when people give you ideas, you don't insult them for giving you ideas. You say thank you. You don't promise to do everything. Leadership's not a popularity contest, but you do promise to listen, to be open-minded, to hear them and say thank you. And what I found is that people learn so much from divergent groups. We have uh, athletes and Broadway people and leaders and all these different types of people from different walks of life. And I always found they learn so much from each other. And again, back to my micro level, it's just teaching people to respect other people's opinions and fight the urge to talk. Because usually, you know, somebody says something, what do I say, but, 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 no, 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 argue, 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 and it just all kind of degenerates, as opposed to saying, this person's just trying to help me. Listen, thank them, be open-minded, and if it works, do it, and if it doesn't, don't. And what I found in our groups with the 60 people is, we'd have them in groups of 10, is what I found is that Maybe I give you an idea, well, maybe it didn't work for you, but maybe it helps somebody else and that they could benefit as well. So I, I like the idea, and this is not macro, mine is much more micro level though. Yeah, well, all change is micro first, isn't it? Right, Many, if you think about it, all change is personal, then it becomes, you know, societal. So thank you. David? Um, I'm David Allen. Uh, two things come to mind, and it's where diversity wasn't. I grew up going to public schools in Shreveport, Louisiana. Never met a black person other than our, than our maid. Hmm. And I started to, this was, this was the 60s, I graduated in 64. Uh, and as the things were starting, I was starting to create communications with the black high school and got very much in trouble with my girlfriend's father for that. Um, another place that it wasn't, I was in graduate school in Berkeley, 1968. Anybody remember Berkeley in 1968? On strike, shut it down. Yeah. Most of the politicos were 
pardon my French, assholes. So they weren't willing to talk to people, and the people they were not willing to talk to weren't willing to talk to them either. So those were two sort of negative examples of that. The positive example that I experienced, first of all, I went to a strange little college called New College in Sarasota, Florida, where we designed our own education, no grades, and they had a student body for people all over the US of all different types. They didn't know what kind of kid was gonna work there, and so they just picked anybody who stood out in some way in their high school. So that was a three years uh, of, of dealing with a lot of diversity in that regard. And I'd say probably the best example, uh, and I say this because I was an intellectual history major in my academic uh, side of things, and in graduate school I was uh, an American intellectual history major, studying the history of thought uh, in the US, fascinated by it. And uh, eight years ago, my wife and I moved from Santa Barbara to Amsterdam, which is where I live now. And I didn't, the funny thing about it is that I thought, well, gee, I'm, I'm leaving America. I really love the American thought process. And what I discovered was uh, I, I got to the source. Because most of the American thought process actually started within a few kilometers of where I live right now, was where the Enlightenment started, because there was no feudal society. Uh, the feudal society was built on the power of the monarchy or the church. Their power came from land. There was no land in the Netherlands. They have a saying, you know, God created the world and then the Dutch created the Netherlands. <laughs> uh, and they did that by harnessing uh, by blocking things and pumping water out, called polders. They still talk about it, they still have what's called the polder consciousness. Why? You can't build a dike by yourself. And so what happened was they all came together in a community, built the dikes, and then shared the spoils. It's still part of the Dutch culture, which is uh, individual uh, group cooperation for individual gain. It's still there. And it's fascinating. Amsterdam has 172 nationalities that live in the city. Uh, and so I'm in a culture that, uh, one of the reasons we love it so much there now is because it is an island and it's an oasis of global thinking. Because the Dutch loved, learned, learned to think globally. Why? Their god is money. <laughs> and they were merchants of the world. First stock exchange was there. You know, they, and they did all kinds of nasty things as the colonial people did, but they were not interested in building an empire, they were interested in building money. And so that, interestingly enough, uh, that led them to an, such an openness in their culture. They had to be open to all the, uh, to every race, uh, because a lot of the, the goods came from all, all over the world. And so they actually structured it that way. So. Anyway, I didn't feel like I, I, I still love the American culture and the American thought process, but it was interesting to, to be in a place right now that's one of the best demonstrations of a culture that is diverse and uh, celebrates that. Thank you, David. Very, very thought provoking. Stephen. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Stephen Heinz. I'm the president of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, but I had the great pleasure of working at the East-West Institute for the decade of the 1990s and then serving on the board. So I just want to start my comments by thanking all of you who have been part of the East-West story all these years and thanking the College of Charleston for being the location of the legacy, the ongoing legacy of the work of the Institute and John Rose. And it's, it's really an honor to be here and it's certainly an honor to be on a panel with these folks, some of whom, some of the greatest uh, leaders in the theory and the practice of leadership, and I am just trying to be a humble student of leadership uh, in the work that I do. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the opposite um, perspective from Marshall, who said he started from the micro. I'm gonna start from the macro, because we are living in an extraordinarily tumultuous period. And it's even pre invasion of Ukraine. John spoke about some of this this morning. You know, I, I see a challenge with the three core operating systems 
of modern civilization that have served humanity well for 350 years or longer in some cases, now all showing signs of deep anachronism, obsolescence, failure, systemic failure. You talked about systems. And the three core operating systems are carbon-fueled capitalism, which we know has produced a great deal of wealth, lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, you know, given people longer lives. It's, it's really been a very good force in the world, but we now know it's also destroying the planet. The second is the nation-state system, which actually goes back to 1648 in the Treaty of Westphalia. And the nation-state system is what created the notion of sovereignty that the Ukrainians are fighting for today. But it also means that we think of the boundaries of the nation-state as the most important locus of decision-making, of power, of problem-solving. And yet we know now the challenges of our world cut across nation-states and our clinging to our national identities and to our nation states prevents us from finding solutions to problems like climate change. And the third one, frankly, is representative democracy, which, you know, started out with the Enlightenment. And where we are today, I think, in American democracy in particular, is a representative democracy that is not very representative nor very democratic. So these three core operating systems that have produced so much positive change in human history are now showing signs of not working very well, and they need to be reinvented, reimagined for the challenges of the 21st century. So the kind of leadership that I think that calls on is divergent leadership and leadership that can manage through difference. And I, I know that Marshall and, and David, because I've had the wonderful opportunity to work with both of them over the years, we're also influenced by Peter Drucker, as I have been. Great management thinker, practitioner, theorist. And, and Peter wrote in, I think it was 1980, one of you guys probably knows the exact date, but he said, the greatest danger in times of turbulence is not the turbulence. It is to act with yesterday's logic. Mm. The greatest danger in times of turbulence is not the turbulence. It is to act with yesterday's logic. And I think we are in one of those moments where it is about inventing the logic of the future. Mm. And we can't do that with conventional wisdom. Mm. We can't do that without bringing different voices into the thinking and the mm. process and the experimenting. We can't do it thinking we have all the answers. Mm. We need to be humble. We need to be ready to fail. We need to be ready to experiment. And we need to be ready to listen deeply and learn and keep at it. Because this is really a world historical moment. Yeah, I'm thinking when you said that, David, thank you, was Stephen, sorry, was thinking about my friend Monty Hummel, who used to run the World Wildlife Fund in Canada. And he said to me, um, he said, John, there's no other time, I often think, is there any other time I would want to be alive? And he said, I answered no, because this is the moment when it's all going to be decided. And it's a bit arrogant and maybe hyperbolic, but I think it's true that we're living in a particularly important inflection moment in human history. And I, I love how you kind of talked about these operating systems. And before I open it up to, to others, one of the things that occurs to me is that almost all of our things that you know, we do, whether to connect Marshall's micro, right? You think about, you know, I'm trained in psychology and you're having a fight with your wife or husband or partner and you realize you're triggering them and they're triggering you. So maybe they grew up in a house where the only way you could survive was to be quiet and stay under the radar. So when there's conflict, they go quiet and stay under the radar. The other person grew up in a house where you, if you didn't assert yourself, you got nothing. So both people, it was adaptive for them when they were children, and now it's destroying their relationship. And I often think that you know, the, all the things you talked about were actually adaptive at one time in human history. And one of the hardest things to give up is that which actually was adaptive in a different situation, right? So the, the, the climate is a great example, right? In a world where there were few human beings, 
and the earth was still pretty plentiful and the biodiversity was rich, you could pretty much plunder the earth and it was adaptive for humans. Hmm. But that's not the situation we're in anymore. But we're still acting just like that person is in the household. An argument that I had when I was a kid that worked for me, but it doesn't work now. Yeah, Marshall, go ahead. You know, that gives me one thought. What got you here? won't get you there. <laughs> that, should, that should be a book. I think someone wrote a book on that subject, uh, Marshall. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so, and it, but it's true. But it's true. Yeah, go ahead. You know, speaking of John Rose, and I, I care not, how long? 40 years? 40, 45. I almost moved into their house in, uh, in Massachusetts, right? Uh, back then. I started coaching John. You know, many of you you may not know I'm a productivity coach, uh, and that's how we met, and we kept going from there. But one of the fascinating things about John was I remember coaching him oh, several years later in the New York office. He had just flown back from Moscow and opened his briefcase. It was a lot of my work. I worked with all the stuff that people have collected around them. <laughs> he opened his briefcase, and it almost exploded with all the op-eds that he'd torn out of, the, out of the newspapers while he was traveling because he wanted to know how the world was thinking. Mm. He never stopped that. Mm. Right. And he was so hungry to find out, tell me, tell me, what is that, what's that, where is that, where does that go, what does it do? And uh, you know, a great example of uh, somebody who never stopped being uh, not only open to diversity, but but hungry for it. Mm -hmm. he, he really, he, he ate it alive, really. <laughs> I mean, it, Stephen, you know. Mm, you absolutely. Know. Yeah. You know, and that, that also um, leads me to, to want to share the following thought, which is, you know, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of leadership work that talks about leading through change or leading change. Um, and I think what we need to be doing is actually pursuing change. You know, it's, it's not about trying to manage change that's happening around us, although there's a lot of that. It's really about in, inventing and imagining and then pursuing change, because we know that if we don't change, as Marshall says, we're not going to get there. And so it, the leadership that, that I think is really essential today is leadership that embraces the imperative of change and then calibrates the absorptive capacity of the institutions they're leading or the society in which they're leading or the places in which they're leading. It measures the absorptive capacity so that the change can be embraced in a way that the institution will actually root deeply in its work and culture. Yeah, and, and I pick two things, then Rand, I wanna to come to you. That, yeah. You know, Marshall, you talked about curiosity, right? And uh, when, Dave, when you told that story about John, you thought about that incredible curiosity that demonstrated about how other people were thinking about things. And so many people are mostly curious about what they're thinking. Like Fran Leibowitz, the Jewish philosopher, said there's only two forms of communication, talking and waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Think about how many times you're in a meeting and someone makes a point and no one even references the point that anyone else made except themselves. So that that curiosity and that willingness to say that our job now as leaders is to actually create change. Yeah. But Rand, I want to come back to our democracy, because obviously yeah. a number of people have already mentioned that, you know, uh, our democracy used to be messy, now it just seems messed up. <laughs> and I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts are, not so much on how we got here, though, if you want to go there, but, you know, what do we need to do to be in a more productive place? But yeah. go, go wherever you want. Right. To start with so that. that's difficult. Um, <laughs> how we got here. Um, and I moved to Washington in 1987. It was a sleepy, small, polite town where everybody called you ma'am and sir and drank sweet tea all the time, which being from the <laughs> Northeast, I didn't know what that was. And I understood what it could do. Um, to where we are today, which people don't talk to each other. Um, I do think a lot of that is certainly the political environment. How did we get there? More and more divisions within the parties created by our so-called leaders. 
our elected leaders of the party. And there's no question, um, the 2016 presidential election was the most contentious that I can remember, and I was born in the 60s. Um, and there's no question the mannerisms and the approach and the way that President Trump ran his campaign, which began as sort of this outsider businessman and turned into you know, a disrespectful name-calling situation and then ended up not just getting the nomination but winning. And here's a guy who had never been involved in politics and to the extent that he had, he was a Democrat and contributed to Democratic candidates. Um, and so I think he had carte blanche to rule the way that he did. I will tell you as a Republican, I was one of them who said, well, you know, maybe this guy's gonna shake up Washington. Maybe that's what we need is just a business leader. But unfortunately, he degraded the system where he brought individuals in that did not have expertise in the areas. It was okay to kind of treat this political position which had been so respected for so long as more of an experiment. Um, and he played off of this. And what I think he learned over his four years was that there's black and white, that there is no gray, that gray doesn't exist. And the way that you gain power and strength and get the respect not only of the people in America, but throughout the international community is to be brash and brazen and see things in black and white. And some will say that to a certain extent he was successful. Um, but as the end of his four years came to a close and he was confronted with the fact that he did not succeed and he was not elected, then you know the proverbial all hell broke loose. Um, and it's amazing to me because I think the seeds of this black and white have been sowed by him but got worse afterwards. I was having a conversation over lunch today where it is just stunningly amazing to me that his followers take an issue. Let's take Russia and Ukraine, okay? There's no question in my mind, not only as an American, but as a Republican and a Ronald Reagan, <laughs> you know, acolyte that Russia, what they did, absolutely horrible, horrid, without excuse, invading a country with no premise. And yet, President Trump had created a cadre of Americans who in the beginning actually were supporting Putin. I mean, how did we get there? How did we get there through none other than his leadership? I'm, I'm sorry to tell you. How do we get out of it? Well, a number of ways. And again, this is very political. You know, we have elections coming up in 2022, this year. In the fall, this will be a real test of who wins who loses, even if the Republicans do take control of the House and Senate, as is expected. Who are these Republicans? What kind of Republicans are they? Are they Trump-endorsed candidates, or are they not? It may lessen down and tamper down that power a little bit. But also, of course, we're coming up to 2024, and there are a lot of Republicans who um, do not want President Trump to be the nominee again in 2024, and are actively working against that. Um, the Democrats have a bench. I can likely tell you that President uh, Biden's not running again, and I don't think Kamala Harris will do that well amongst the crowd. So we may have a really open race in 2024, and that may, to, to, to go to the solution of this all and bringing people together, that may help, or it may not. And I'm afraid that if we continue down this path, it, it's going to become worse. And what makes it worse is difficult decisions by President Biden, including what's going on in Ukraine. I mean, wouldn't want to be that leader if you paid me enough money. It's, it's everything America stands for, democracy and human rights and international law, and then to just sit and watch this happen. It's painful. It's painful to all of this. And no matter how much you say no troops on the ground, US national interests, they're not a member of NATO, it doesn't resonate. It's difficult, and to be a leader, especially him, right now, it's, it's very hard. So I'm not sure I know what the solution is. I think one of the big reasons, I think you mentioned it this morning, um, is the press and how the press works. If you're not familiar with it, I highly recommend, a very close friend of mine is James Fallows. And James has, has he was a senior editor at, at, uh, at The Atlantic, 
and he's now started his own newsletter called Breaking the News, mm -hmm. and it's fabulous. It's, it, and, and I don't know how much impact it's going to have, but um, Jim and Deb are, are, are great people, and uh, anything you can do to help support his message, because he, he is right on about the polarity in the press, and even critical of things like the New York Times and Washington Post in terms of how they're reporting. Sure. I think you mentioned an example you know, recently. And so, you know, stop playing the theater, you know, in, the, in that. So anything any of us can do to help support that. So, again, James Fallows, Breaking the News, great newsletter. Hmm. Stephen, go ahead. You're, you're, uh, it just, you're twitching. You probably have something <laughs> to say. <laughs> I'm, you know, on the, on the question of American democracy, um, it's one of the areas that the Rockefeller Brothers Fund works on, one of the three. We work on democracy, climate change, and peace, and you can see how much progress we're making. Um, but in any case, I also had the privilege to co-chair a national commission on American democracy that was brought together by Jonathan Fenton, who's with us when he was president of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And so we had 35 commission members, very diverse in every uh, meaning of that word, including ideological, um, but also parts of the country, ethnic and racial backgrounds, different disciplines in life, business people, scholars, practitioners, advocates, theologians, a playwright. And we spent two years together, starting in uh, 2018, examining what was the status of American democracy and what was causing our democracy to to wither, and um, I won't go into great details, but I, I will say that it's, a, it's not a process that started with Donald Trump. I think he has been an accelerant to the process, but it's a process that has been underway for, if you look at the data in various ways, for about 40 years, maybe 45 years, of a kind of a slow erosion of our democracy. And some of it was intentional, by political parties, by political leaders, and of course Donald Trump, being the most recent example, an intentional degradation of the institutions and values of our democracy in order simply to gain and wield power. And the, the information environment in which we now live exacerbates the problem. Economic inequality exacerbates the problem. Persistent racism in our society exacerbates the problem, and on and on and on. So we now have a perfect storm that threatens to blow down our democracy. So the commission uh, issued a report in June of 2020 called Our Common Purpose, Reinventing American Democracy for the 21st Century. And it, it provides 31 quite specific recommendations, not only about the institutions, for example, some very interesting and bold ideas like enlarging the size of the House of Representatives to make it more representative again. It wasn't always 435 members. It doesn't, it's not fixed in the Constitution. 18-year term limits on the U.S. Supreme Court so that one party can't control it for decades and decades and decades, et cetera. But not only institutional fixes, we need to be fixing and worrying about our civic culture in this country. And this is another place where Jim and Deb Fallows have done remarkable work documenting across the country work in communities that is actually the work about building democracy from the ground up. Uh, so we have a whole series of recommendations <coughs> there, and we also offer recommendations on the information environment. And we are working as a commission very hard to try to push forward these 31 recommendations between now and 2026, which is the 250th anniversary of our nation. So. I really hope that you will look at the report. You can get it on the American Academy of Arts and Sciences uh, webpage, which is amacad, A-M-A-C-A-D dot O-R-G. And it's our common purpose. And um, please let me know what you think of it. Um, give us some divergent thinking. Challenge us. Um, ask the questions, but get involved. Because we will not actually fix this troubled democracy unless we do it together in the Dutch way. We have to build the dike together. You know, interesting you say that because the, the polar consciousness is still there. And the Dutch have a very interesting approach to politics. The divergence, of, and there's quite a bit of divergence in the Dutch 
uh, culture itself. It's a contested thing. And, and, uh, but what they do is they actually get all the interested parties together in a non-public arena and they get consensus before they go public about the issues so that the people can't grandstand on the issue. Uh, and that's, that's an interesting, interesting thing about the good and bad news of uh, uh, open, well, Woodrow Wilson, open covenants openly arrived at, mm -hmm. is one of the most dangerous things that happened from my, my historical perspective, because what happened was nobody could compromise. You had to, you had to say the party line. That you you would be ostracized. You would you would lose your career mm -hmm. if you actually compromised. And so that's why I think, um, you know, uh, well, civil rights that was compromise. And I, maybe that's the forty years you're talking about. Mm -hmm. What what happened was you know there was a lot of negotiation. There was a lot of bike back and forth, and uh, you know. It, it, maybe we can get back there again. Yeah. You know, so it, it, you know, and I completely agree, David, about the, 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 the media is such an Im, Im, important piece. I know my friend Dan, who used to run the National Federation of Independent Business and was in the Reagan administration. He's been in Washington a long time. I said, so what's changed in, you know, since, you know, you first came to Washington? And two things he said, he said, when I first came to Washington, almost every member of Congress moved their family to Washington. Now, especially in the House, very few of them do. So it used to be you'd argue you know, on the floor, and then on Friday night you'd watch your kids' baseball game or soccer game together, and you'd say, come on, Nick, you got to work something out. He said the other thing that's changed, which is the media piece, he said is if you're relatively moderate in either party and you suggest, even hint, that you want to reach common ground, the, uh, the, the social media media on the right or the left attack you like an antibody attacks the virus and gets you back in line. So that, and so back to this thing about like Trump probably is more, though he is himself, you know, uh, obviously a phenomenon, is a symptom of something. I saw a great headline when he first got elected, and this, forgive me, this, I'm, I'm kind of an independent, so I, I'm not, I don't really consider him a Democrat or Republican, but uh, I think he, the line was great. It said, the Republicans lit the house on fire. Uh, no, uh, lit the torch and Trump burned the house down. And his, the point of the op-ed was that for years the Republican Party especially had said, government is bad, Washington is bad, you can't trust it. But it was really like uh, not meant the way, but Trump took that torch and then without people knowing a lot, burned the whole house down. But to me, it's not about Republicans or Democrats. It's like, how do we, how do we start, I guess, to find common ground? You mentioned local. I remember I was in Louisville, which is kind of a Democrat and Republican in a, in a Republican state, speaking the morning after the 2016 election. And the mood was really somber because no one wanted to be flouting that they were happy or sad, right? Because like the room was about 50-50. And the guy who was chairing this particular, you know, business group got up and said, so what do we do on a morning like this? He said, we do what we always do in Louisville. He said, we come together to solve problems. And I thought, I think local is part of the way change happens because I think it's hard to hate up close. And local, often you have real problems that you can touch and feel together. But anyway, what are your thoughts on how we maybe even change the conversation? Um, and then I'm also interested in going back in this nation state piece to me is an interesting piece. But you know, you guys, I'd love to take it where you want to go too. Who'd like to? Can I ask Marshall a question? Yeah, please, <laughs> right. I was going to ask him one soon, but you so, probably have a better one. So, so Marshall, it just, it just um, this conversation about our politics and political system, just lead me to ask, have you ever worked with a political client? Um, no. So if you, if you were, what, what, what would you, how would you work with them? How would you, if we need to create political leaders who are prepared to compromise, to listen to the opposite side, to thank them for their mm -hmm. input, to be curious, right? To be curious. How how would you work with a with a candidate for public office to, to try to create the kind of political leadership we need? 
Well, one reason I haven't worked with political people is usually they have no interest in listening in what I do, uh, and and to be, I mean, <laughs> so I mean, they have really zero interest in what I do. That tells you something, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. So I, you know, they, I I would say that I was listening to the discussion. Peter Drucker, back to Peter Drucker, taught me one point that I think is good for everybody. He said, and I repeat this point over and over and over again. Our mission in life is to make a positive difference, not to prove we're smart, not to prove we're right. And to me, that just, I, over and over I repeat that. Our, our mission is to make a positive difference. We're not here on earth to prove we're smart and right. We're here to make a positive difference. And if you don't make a positive difference, who cares how smart you are and who cares how right you are, number one. And number two, every decision is made by the person who has the power to make the decision, make peace with that not the smartest person, the right person, a good person, or a fair person, and if I need to influence you, and you have the power to make the decision, there's one word to describe you, customer, there's one word to describe me, salesperson. Customers don't have to buy, salespeople have to sell. Sell what you can sell, change what you can change. If you can sell it, you sell it, you change it, you change it. You can't change it, you can't sell it, do something else. And I think, you know, we just get lost in trying to prove we're smart and trying to prove we're right, for what? Mm -hmm as opposed to saying, what am I gonna to do to make a positive difference here? Like Peter said, we're not here on earth to prove we're smart, and it's hard. I mean, in our lives, we've been given test after test. How many tests have you taken? Thousands. Your whole mission in life has been prove how smart you are thousands of times, over and over and over again. It's hard to stop. Mm. It is very hard to stop doing this and say, why am I doing this? Why am I proving I'm smart? Why am I proving I'm right? What's the point of all this? I'm not making a positive difference. So. I guess to me, just trying to get people, myself, to focus on, am I doing anything to make a positive difference here? Other than just trying to prove how smart I am. And you know, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. It's not easy. I mean, we have been reinforced from society from birth to prove we're smart. And we're ashamed not to. And it's so hard to break that habit, so hard. I don't know if that made any sense. I. I Back to your point this morning, John. Uh, the spiritual system. Uh, the, anything any of us can do to get people to be more reflective about the why. You know, in business, there are the five whys. You want to do that? Why? Well, and then why do you, why do you want to do that? Well, why do you want to do By the time you get to the fifth why, you kind of get to the basis of stuff. And interestingly, and this is a little bit of a sidebar, but again, it's about John Moreau's. Um, the initial name of the institute was the East-West Security Studies, right? Mm. And that was to bring NATO and Warsaw Pact researchers together in a collaborative environment uh, to make sure that nobody pushed the button. And at some point, especially after 1989, you know, John had the question, I know we had that discussion, it's called, is there still a reason for the Institute to exist. <coughs> and a fascinating thing uh, that I've discovered in my work with a, a lot of people, entrepreneurs and startups and, and so forth, is oftentimes they aren't really aware of what their purpose really is. Oftentimes they're, they're, they're operating with a fire in the belly about something. And many times only when they have some major change, uh, um, somebody wants to buy them, they want to buy something else, they have to step back and go, well, wait a minute, what are we really about? And those are always the great questions to, as you know, to ask and to be asked. And what happened was the Institute, and you know, you guys probably know more of how that transition happened, was that it became the East-West Institute because there were obviously issues that were spreading around the world. And John Morose is the first person I heard say, the issue is not between East and West, it's Islam. And he was the first person to nail what was going to be coming up. He, was, he, he had this incredible knack. Again, so he didn't, he didn't really change his purpose, he re-understood it. I've never actually met or run across an organization that changed its purpose. I've run across many that we understood it in a new way so they could, they could be viable. And John always had that purpose. He never really changed in terms of his passion about that stuff. And one unique thing, this is just a sidebar story, but I just have to tell it. One of the unique things about John was that he would be in a room 
with lots of heavyweight people and so forth. And he wouldn't be interested in the person who was in the headlines. Hmm. He, he could look across a room and see the person that he knew was the one that would pull the strings and would really work. He had a knack about that, which was uncanny, but it was because he was driven by this purpose that he was open to, to talk to whoever he needed to talk to to get it done hmm. and, to, and, to, and to make that happen. So he was such a great model to me about that kind of um, coming back to what's really internally driving me and, you know, doing good. Doing good. Yeah. Here, yeah, so I wanted to say something about, you know, back to the discussion on democracy. Um, I think there's a lack of accountability right now where, you know, you see what you see in our political system because they're not, they don't feel accountable to the voting population, you know. Mm -hmm. You look at the way things are set up, primary, general elections, and even the electoral college, which is nonsense. You know, how many times have we had candidates win the popular vote, lose the electoral college? So my proposal would be go back and look at our, starting with K through 12, civic education. And not just what I learned, right? I learned about, oh, the romanticized American history and the Revolutionary <laughs> War. That's how I got interested in politics as a kid. That our whole educational system needs to be changed in a way that K through 12 learns about civic education in a different way, and a way that makes people much more responsible mm -hmm. and want to go vote. Like, when is the last, can I take a poll here in the audience? Did anybody vote in their primaries? Do you even know when your primaries are? Ooh, that's pretty good. That's probably half of you. But most Americans don't vote. And the ones that vote in the primaries are the ones that would run out during a rainstorm and get hit by a bus to get to that poll. That is why you have extreme candidates, okay, on both sides. Um, a lot of people say, oh, it's not gonna make a difference. I'm an engineer. Why should that, why voting isn't gonna make a difference? Those guys and gals in Washington don't listen to me. We need to change that. We need to make everybody in America feel that voting as your privilege as a United States citizen is the most important privilege that you have. And that is not the case right now. It's very much taken for granted. I don't have time to go. The polls are closing. And that's just of the most simplistic thing. Of course, democracy is made up of a lot more than that. But if we change that civic education, K through 12, college, all of those nice young people out there that are political science majors and beyond, I said the you know the engineering majors, every major across the board should be having a lesson, whether you want to call it civics or American electoral systems, um, and even integrated within that leadership. How does one lead? Mm. How does one lead? Going back to the original title of this panel, how do you lead through difference? How do you lead when you don't agree, right? Or when you're confronted with a pandemic, or when you're confronted with a war? How do you lead? when you have a terrorist attack on American soil. Um, I've seen a lot in my political government service, and I've seen great leaders, and I've seen terrible ones. Um, and so that may be helpful if we change our whole educational system. So, Randa, in a moment I'm going to open it up because we want to get some questions sure. from you guys. So get ready. But I, I want to, before you do it, I want to make a, just one comment about <laughs> I'm really interested in what you said about education, right? And, you know, can we have an educational system that er, very early on teaches people to be curious? And especially for Americans to learn about the rest of the world in an authentic way. I always joke, like, when I, I live in Canada and the United States, because I married a Canadian, though my mother was Canadian, you know, and then well, my kids went through school in, in Canada. And what I realized is when I went to school, I had one year of, you know, world history. Mm -hmm. I feel like I learned about the Civil War, the Revolutionary War, like time and time again, you know, the same stories over and over again. By the way, with no really, you know, there was no uh, alternative reality. You know, Christopher Columbus was a nice Italian-American like my dad, who, you know, arrived to waving colored people, you know, in the West Indies, right? Um, it was not uh, there was no, I'm not saying teach different, just teach, well, what do you think, right? And I think there is something to what you said about like, and then I, when I went to Canada, I realized my kids learned a little bit of Canadian history and they learned a lot about the world. 
And I felt, you know, I, I mean, Canada is not a perfect country, but I can tell you we don't have the kind of division by any means that we have here. And I think a part of it does, the education system is a small piece of it, a small piece. Let's open it up. We have lots of questions. Yeah, you had, I saw your hand first, so. Can, can you talk a little louder? Yeah. yeah, talk a little louder or get a microphone if we can. Yeah, please say your name. Uh, my great. name is Peter Lehman. I'm on the LACWA board. So one big question I have that drives me crazy, mm -hmm. money in politics. Money is the root of the political problem, in my opinion. How do we limit it, get it out of it, so it changes the dialogue? It, it's a huge issue, mm -hmm. the biggest issue. Anybody yeah. want to tackle that? Yeah, money is the mother's milk of politics. It still is. Um, it's a Supreme Court decision equating money in political activity with free speech. So the question is, we have to go back and unravel a lot of laws. And if you decouple that, if you will, um, there have been attempts over the past 30 to 40 years to restrict the amount of money and the sources of money. For instance, no foreign money in domestic political races. But individuals, organizations create PACs and shadow PACs and other types of PACs. IRS disclosure requirements sometimes are not the best. So we have to backpedal on that and start to challenge the legal requirements that in certain circumstances money is speech and the entities of corporations and others. But it, one individual can be hugely influential right now in controlling these political candidates and certain parties as well. Yeah. We have two microphones here. Uh, I'm going to be here on this side, and then Liza is on the other side. I also want to make an announcement for our remote audience. The webinar uh, participants, uh, I'm monitoring the questions, so if you have any questions for our speakers, please use the chat feature. So just in the interest of time, I'll kind of limit response to two people. So go ahead, Stephen, you wanted just, to say a quick Just response. to quickly support what Rhonda was saying. The, the key thing, unfortunately, is that to really have an impact on reducing the power of money in our politics is going to require a constitutional amendment. That's a big threshold, but let's not forget, we've amended the Constitution, what is it, 27 times, I think, and, and 13, I think I counted at one point, in my lifetime alone. So it's not impossible. And there are people around this country who are mobilizing to do the steps that you have to do in all 50 states to get to this threshold. It will take some time, but it's important work. Yeah, great. Well said. Yeah. Or, who's next? Yeah. Oh, OK, great. We got here, too. So I go got ahead. the microphone. Yeah. Uh, Bruce McConnell. Bruce. So uh, I, I want to comment first uh, quickly on Rhonda's point about voting. I work with uh, organizations that try to guarantee elections, and they refer to voting as that is the right that secures all our other rights. So it's, it's a core thing. But I wanted to go back to this question, I think that you raised, Marshall, about the polder mentality. And, uh, and the, uh, right, no, no, that's right, yes. Uh, sorry. And uh, that dealt with um, the ability of the Dutch, which is a, a small country, uh, and you know, everybody went to school together, so there's this sort of this uh, conversation that happens among uh, political elites uh, that comes up with deals, and that works, and then they go out and sell them. So that's, uh, that's kind of cooperation can happen in that environment. And the other, uh, the other piece of that is transparency, right? So we all we want transparency and everything like that, and now we're moving to a society and a world where everything is transparent, everything you do is transparent, whether you like it or not. So I don't know if we can go back to the back room where people of goodwill get together and have those kinds of conversations anymore in the political environment. And it gets to the question of accountability Rhonda was raising because, uh, because transparency is one of the ways that we use to hold people accountable. So I don't know how to unpack that, but I'm curious about your, your views and also others. I think that's for you. Um, well, the Dutch complain about the polder consciousness themselves, but the Dutch <laughs> complain about everything. So, you know, there's, there's nothing really new there, and they're they're highly self-critical. But I, I kind of like that. Uh, and you know, the Dutch had a huge influence on the American thought process. I mean, look at Manhattan; it used to be New Amsterdam, right? And a lot of people actually came to the Puritan world 
thinking they would get religious freedom. And it turned out that the Puritans were burning people at the stake and was the worst place to be if you wanted you know, free, free freedom. So they all drifted down to New York, which was party time. And that became a whole lot of what the culture was about. Not addressing the answer. I don't, I don't know how you do that. I don't know how you get back to the back rooms. Although I think, again, Jim, Jim and Deb Fallow's book, Our Towns, mm -hmm. is a marvelous, marvelous treatment of how you can grow from the ground up and a lot about diversity. That was a lot of the issues that these towns were having to deal with. And so, uh, but I think each town has to have some sort of a champion, you know, in some way to make it, to make it work. The good news is systems sometimes have to get really broken before they change. And I think the one thing that there is a growing consensus about is that it's not working. Mm -hmm. So I think that's actually, I think sometimes we ought to fan that rather than our divisions, let's all as citizens come to, is this working for any of us? Mm -hmm. No, it's not. Let's then begin to talk about why it's not working and how we might do it differently. Because I don't think it's gonna happen from the top down. It's gonna happen from the bottom up because the citizens in a way, through obviously people helping that process to say, you know, this, this isn't really working for any of us. And that'd be my most hopeful scenario. Who's, who's next? I think I'm, I'm next. Dazzle had his hand up over here as well. Yeah, go ahead. Is that okay? Yeah. I have Justin. Right? Me? Uh, you have the microphone. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. I'll, okay. Thanks, guys, for a great panel, and thank you for, for being here. The one thing is I just have to second whoever it was who said that John didn't always go to the big wigs and ask them. I worked for him from 2004 to 2006, and I just remember one time we were in Vienna, and there were all these big wigs. And he didn't ask them what they thought. He went to this kid, he worked at Nestle, and he asked him what he thought. So I've, I've seen that before. My question is for Stephen, and it's really about, um, so many people are trying to figure out what's happening in China right now. What, what, are, what are they trying to do? They're, my wife kind of wants to move there because they've limited screen times for kids to one hour a week. Um, there's, there's no tutoring for kids for like the top 1%. How much of what they're doing is looking at the gap between the haves and the have nots in America and saying, we want to avoid that. And we are trying to kind of get back to some of our communist roots in order to do that. And when you look at the gap between the haves and the have nots here, how much of it is just is money or other things as you guys study that? Thanks. Well, there's a lot. There's a lot in those questions, Justin. And I think the quick answer is I don't know. Um, it's very hard to be able to say what's really happening in China, in part because it's it's becoming a more and more closed society. We do, as a foundation, do a lot of work in China. We have an office in China. We are one of a handful of American nonprofit organizations that actually got legally registered when the Chinese government passed a new law saying, you want to operate here, you have to get registered. And it's a, I won't go into the whole details, it was a long, laborious process, and it, it constrains what we can do. Because we have to, as a grant maker, you know, our job primarily is to make grants. And so we're supporting lots of Chinese NGOs who are working on questions of environment and human health, climate change, pr principally. Every year, we have to deliver to the government now an annual plan saying these are the grants we propose to make next year. And they will either approve that plan or not. They can veto individual grants or call you in to make you defend a grant that you're planning to make. And they come and visit our office unannounced regularly and want to look at the books and want to interview our program director. It's becoming a very, very difficult place to work. Um, but I will say this about the Chinese. I also serve on a, a major Chinese government advisory panel on the environment, and they are looking long-term as, as they always have. They are thinking 50 and 75 years ahead. They are recognizing that climate change is actually killing their population and that their continued reliance on coal is killing their population. And so while they are working to reduce economic inequality, the other question you raised, Justin, and they've made huge progress of lifting hundreds of millions of Chinese out of abject poverty in a remarkably short period of time, decades, 
hundreds of millions. They have done that with no regard for the envir environment and fueling it with coal largely, which has caused the premature deaths of something like 500,000 Chinese people a year because of lung diseases of various kinds. So they know all this. Now they're trying to move very rapidly to get off coal and get onto renewables. They're also buying gas from Mr. Putin in bigger and bigger quantities. What they're trying to do now, in my view, is to at least achieve some kind of geostrategic parity with the United States. And to be an important pole in a multipolar world. They see this as a, the post-Cold War period, as a unipolar world where the United States asserted dominance and is intentionally trying to keep China down. They, they will tell you this, that the purpose of the United States is to keep China from rising. And, you know, you listen to that, and I don't think that's true, but there's no way I can you know, even in a friendly conversation with a colleague, convince them that that's not the case. So until we figure out a way, and I don't know whether this crisis with Russia and Ukraine is actually going to provide the opportunity, but this is divergent thinking where we need to think of what does this crisis provide us the opportunity to do? And one of the things it may do is to ask ourselves the question, so what is the role of the United States in the world in this century? And does it make sense to actually try to be the predominant power in this century? Or should we figure out a path to distribute power and create a more collaborative world system? And if we did that, would the Chinese respond positively? I don't know. But I, I think those are the kinds of questions we now have to ask ourselves and not immediately rush to the conclusion that just because we really don't like the Chinese system, and I don't either, and I don't like the human rights violations and what they're doing to the Uyghurs in Xinjiang province, we have to ask ourselves, are we right to impose our system on them or can we figure out ways of living with them for the betterment of humankind? And it's a, you know, that's why I said at the beginning, I don't know. But those are the kinds of things I think about in any case. Stephen, wow, so thought-provoking, you know. You know, you mentioned the, um, well, I, I like that question about what should the role be and, it can, and, and can we imagine a different kind of world that is more multipolar. multipolar. Just, you know, the one thing you said about, like, the, um, the, the rich and the poor, et cetera, you know, and again, I, everything you said I agree about the Chinese system and the human rights and so on. And, you know, the other thing Carter said to Trump was, you know, while we've spent $2 trillion on war, they've been building high-speed railroads, et cetera. And George Monbot, who's a guy you should follow if you don't read his work from the UK, sometimes he's like really out there. But he said, you know, one of the problems is we have this two worlds, free market capitalism, best system in the world. If you compare it with, you know, socialism in its Soviet like kind of form, obviously. But he said, like, can we move to a place where we, ha right now we have public sufficiency, and in many cases insufficiency, and private luxury. Mm -hmm. So someone can have as much, as many planes as they want, as many billions as they want, and we hope the average citizen can just eat and have a place to live. He said, can we imagine a world where we have public luxury and private sufficiency? He's not talking about socialism where we redistribute wealth, but that the emphasis is we want to fund the pu beautiful parks, beautiful public schools, beautiful spaces everyone can enjoy. And I think one of our challenges is, remember earlier I said one of the worst things, regenerative thinking, we have to stop thinking the system we have is the best of all possible worlds, right? So free market capitalism, it was better than totalitarianism. It's better than you know, socialism as it was practiced in like places like the Soviet Union. Doesn't mean it's better than a system that we might imagine that emphasized private sufficiency and public luxury, but not in the sense you can't have more than anyone else. But anyway, it's a provo you should read some of his work. It's quite provocative. Who's next? Yeah, go ahead. Well, we got a bunch of people, so you guys can get some microphones Hi. in the middle here. I'm gonna go yeah. just because I'm the first woman to talk. Um, <laughs> 
I teach women's leadership, so I can't just sit here and watch all men ask questions. Um, so I'm Samantha Carlin, Empower Global uh, Diversity and Inclusion Training Firm. I also host a talk show called Samantha Politics, which is about global politics. Um, my question is a little bit existential, and I think it's more directed to Stephen and and um, and Rhonda. You know, Rhonda kind of started by saying the one thing Democrats and Republicans agree on is made in America. But at the same time, the reason that the, it, India created a middle class was because call centers were outsourced to India. And so, you know, having products made abroad is not always child labor and human rights abuses. It also can empower a lot of people by getting stuff made abroad. At the same time, um, Stephen talked about the Treaty of Westphalia and sovereignty and the necessity of sovereignty. And then we're seeing, you know, what Rhonda was saying about, I mean, it's killing me watching what happened in Ukraine and knowing that all of our values are basically being flushed down the drain because we don't want to get involved, World War with Russia, you know, Americans don't have an appetite for it. So I think it's this, you know, how do we balance, especially if you're you know, American or whatever you are, but I'm a proud American, I worked for the State Department, you know, how do we balance this desire for national interest at, with this, you know, these larger global crises and also noting that we need to not only empower Americans, but empower other people. But then if you want to run for Congress, you only have to show people that you care about empowering people in this tiny geographic area. Thank you. Okay, so I think I'll try to take both of those. On the empowering of people, yes, I mean, I agree why we are a global economy, empowering other societies at what cost. So I would say to you, and this is my personal opinion, I would be willing to pay an extra $100 for my iPhone if I knew that my next door neighbor has a job. And so at some point, we're to blame. Most certainly, we shipped out these jobs for economic costs. But there are other costs with that. It isn't just economic. And it is everything from, are these people being treated appropriately? What kind of regulations? Is it healthy for Americans to be importing this stuff? What, you know, what, you know, with respect to child labor? I mean, those are our values. That's just not a problem. Those are our values. And so I would say that's nice to empower that society, but at some point, as the leader of the world, we have to say to India, you're on your own. You have a great middle class, good for you. We're glad we could help with that. Now you, now you graduate, now you take it on your own. We're not abandoning you, but we have to think of our own society and our own economy. Um, yeah, I mean, as you know, you served in the State Department. That's the constant push and pull that I have found when I was in government. The balancing of the national interests in, 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 with the other things, whether it's democracy. And I think the best thing is in the area of human rights. So I can give you two examples. When I was in Congress, many senators wanted to cut, not many, a few senators wanted to cut aid to Egypt off. Because even back then, Egypt had really serious problems, human rights challenges. And so the US had to balance what our national interests were against the human rights abuses in Egypt. And you know we waved it and said, OK, wink, wink, we'll continue to give you aid because the billions of dollars we give to Egypt, second only to Israel, as you know, was in our national interests for security and for other purposes. And you know, at the time, Egypt was a real leader in Middle East peace, not sure that that's the case anymore. Another great example, real time, the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. And I brought that up in my energy speech and what has deeply affected our relationships with Saudi Arabia. He was a journalist, I knew him. Um, he wrote for the Washington Post. He was brutally murdered at what our intelligence community has said at the hands of Mohammed bin Salman. Is that more important to us than now what we're finding? Global energy security. And to the point where President Biden called both the Saudis and the Emiratis and they wouldn't take his phone call. They would not take a call from the President of the United States who was calling to say, pump more oil. Wouldn't even take his call. It wasn't like, it was the voicemail, basically. So, I mean, there, the human rights of a journalist, and we stand for everything that that was abhorrent to. The type, the way in which it was murdered, why he was murdered, and yet our national interests are now sky high, and we're being squeezed with respect 
for the global oil supply, and so we had to go to Venezuela. Isn't that even more <laughs> abhorrent? Okay, that type of government, and they're not only their human rights record, but they're just bad actors. So this is the constant push and pull. I don't have the answer, but at points, I have to tell you, sadly, US national interests almost always prevail. And these other things, democracy, human rights, international law, while a wonderful fairy tale, and sometimes in the end is not reality. Stephen? No, it's, it's oh, okay. Okay. Let's All take right. some more questions. Yeah. Can we ask a student to ask a question? Yeah, please, yeah. please. Thank you. I uh, just want to say that the council has been very informative and I appreciate you guys taking the time to come to our college. Uh, my name is Matthew Zinnick. I'm a freshman. And my uh, first question would be to the MAM speaker who uh, was in the administration in the 90s. With America becoming the hegemon that it was with the fall of the Soviet Union, with the rise of globalization, which I wasn't alive for, I was born in 2003, um, how, how you all talk about adversities of leadership, but never the, challenge, the challenges of facing um, when someone else wants to be the leader, like China, like Russia, saying maybe we want to have a turn at the swing. And um, Americans more, with the international stance, we're more uh, in tune to fighting with ourselves than reaching out and doing international um, politics. And don't you think that is the change from the generation lapse of the 90s of never talking about religion or politics but the changing of the ethos of, oh, you're a Democrat and you're on Facebook and I should talk about you without ever talk, like, how do you, how do you talk about the ethos that has changed within America? How can we be a leader when we can't be a leader at home and be a leader on the global stage is my question. Yeah. Should I answer that? Is that directed towards me? Yeah, so thank you for coming. I'm always happy to see young students here, and you have a beautiful college and a great college campus. So I'm happy to, to certainly be here. Um, you know, you're absolutely right, and I think the correct word really is ethos. I have a 24-year-old daughter, and I can't keep up with things that are going on. It's a cultural shift, and it happens. If not one or two generations, it happens. Um, and I think part of that, of course, is what we talked about before, media, but in particular, social media. Social media has provided the opportunity to have the debate with no identity, and because of that, people don't have manners over that. That being said, back to your leadership question, the US has to look long and hard about, do we want to be, I was always taught, you know, after the fall of the Soviet Union, we were, we were it, we were number one. The United States is the global leader, and with that comes responsibilities, but what kind of responsibilities? Are we going to be the world's policeman? No. But I still think, are we going to put boots on the ground? No. Does that mean military? But I still think there is a, you know, leadership through strength, as Ronald Reagan used to say, um, leadership through diplomacy. I think there are still ways in which the U.S. can show that leadership. But I also think missteps in times of domestic crises and international crises can whittle away at that perception of leadership. And I don't think most Americans would say, okay, let's make room at the table for the Russians and the Chinese and the Saudis, because that doesn't work. Look at the United Nations, okay? What used to be a body that actually mattered passes meaningless resolutions and has no teeth although they have lovely offices in New York. Um, so I, I think that, that it's inherent in the nature, something you talked about with politicians, you know, they have egos. It's inherent in our nature as a country to want to be the only leader. There's no more room at the table for anybody else. Um, and so I think that's, if you want to change that, that's gonna be a, that's gonna be a long time incoming. That's my thoughts. I don't know if anybody else agrees or disagrees with that. Well, I just offer maybe a, a different take on it. I, I think it is very hard. Um, and this is, you know, this gets back to that notion that of Peter Drucker's that keeps driving me, which is 
I think that's, frankly, kind of the logic of the past, right? And we need to get to the logic of the future, which is we only have one planet. We're collectively doing a good job of degrading it, putting it on a path toward destruction. We are one human population living with another 1.8 billion species of life. Um, and we have, to, we have to move to a different ethos as, as a global community. We have to move to an ethos of, I know it sounds soft and it would never work in politics, which is why I'm a failed long time ago politician, but we have to move to an ethos of, of caring and sharing. And if we keep clinging to the old ideas, they're going to fail worse and worse. I think we have to start thinking about the new ideas. And this is one of the things that John was always challenging us to do. I mean, we were talking to the Soviets in the very darkest days of the Cold War, when the governments weren't doing a lot of constructive talking. The East-West was hosting talks. Uh, the East-West was hosting talks with the Chinese. You know, and, and that's, the, that's the purpose. If, if it can't happen at the UN, if it can't happen bilaterally between the US government and the government of the People's Republic of China, that's why the kind of work that nonprofits like the Institute do is so important because those conversations can happen and they need to happen because if we don't do as Marshall says and go talk to the people who disagree with us mm -hmm. and listen to them and, and literally express thanks for their point of view and then try to move to a different point of view together, we're not, you know, it's just not going to work. And we're not going to solve these massive problems in this century. And they're going to get worse. That's, that's just my instinct. And just to piggyback on what you said, Stephen, like, to me, I love your question. But to me, an interconnected, interdependent world is inherently more stable and safer than a world where we all go back to our corners. Let's just make everything where we are. Let's, you know, supply our own goods. Let's, you know, build our fortress bigger. And I agree with Stephen, I think that's an idea that worked at one time and it won't, it won't work now, right? Like, you know, the Chinese are, are going to be a powerful force in the don't. years ahead, right? Like, uh, and you know, my wife said something the other day, you know, about uh, the sanctions when she said, when they said, well, maybe they'll sanction China for not sanctioning Russia. And my wife said something really interesting. She said, like, so who is America to tell another sovereign country that if you don't sanction a country that disagrees with what you're doing, that we're going to sanction you, right? I would have hoped we would have called President Z, and I'm not saying he's like some beautiful person, and say, we need your help. You're a power in the world. You're a force now. We think you have the ear of Russia. You're the second biggest economy in the world. Can we work together to figure out how to defuse this? Now, I hope maybe Biden said that, but I, probably not. It doesn't play well at home. It plays well to say, if you don't, we're going to. And I think it's like, it's dangerous because we're not in that world anymore. And I don't think most of the world wants us to be that anymore, right? You know, um, meaning they still want us to be around in case bad crap happens, but they don't really want an American dominated world. That's not what the rest of the world wants. We can do it maybe for a while, but I don't think it's safer and more stable than a world where we're connected with each other. I don't know how it can be, myself. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, right there. John, you got one more question? Yeah, go ahead, one more question, go. Uh, thanks, Bob Bernstein. Um, all right, so first, very quickly on the, on the issue of being reflective, I have to share what John said to me once. It was probably the most important thing I'd ever heard anybody say. And he said, Bob, it's not about who's right, it's about what's right. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking to people that you want to bring into your circle, ask them that question first. Mm -hmm. What's more important to you? Who's right or what's right? Mm -hmm. Because it'll tell you volumes about the next part of the conversation. So this question is for David Marshall. You know, you get a bunch of terrific college kids with all that enthusiasm and curiosity that John had. You now have all the experience of your consulting careers, coaching careers. Given that, and when you started with John 30 years ago plus, what differently would you treat the coaching process? What should these kids be asking for? You know, a, a couple of thoughts 
One is, and I talked about this with a smaller group, we did a study about the leader of the future, and I think this is very positive for the college. And we asked, how is the leader of the future going to be different than the leader of the past? And we actually interviewed young people who would be alive in the future as opposed to existing leaders who would be dead. So I thought that was pretty creative. Right? Sensible. And so, and, and five factors came up, and I was very impressed with the college. One factor was global thinking. Because leadership, if you look at the history of leadership, the cave was not very global. And you had the cave, and then you gradually went up to the, maybe the country and then maybe the region. But now leadership has become much more global. So I think that's very positive for the thing that's here. Number two is also a big deal here, cross-cultural sensitivity and awareness. I mean, our, the American idea of diversity is almost embarrassing when you travel around the world. We act like the entire concept of diversity is just people in the United States, as if there's not any other worlds out there, right? And so cross-cultural diversity is a huge deal, and that's also very positive here. And then the, the uh, next thing is technological savvy. You don't have to be a technologist, but you can't hide from technology anymore. The leader that says, I don't use emails and you know, all that nonsense, that's gone. You have to understand how its technology can impact the core business. The fourth one is building alliances and partnerships, which I also think is very positive here. The idea that the leader is now not just this way, but more and more leadership is building partnerships, alliances with people who might be your competitors sometimes, or your customers, or your partners. And then the final one is more the leader of the facilitator as opposed to the dictator. Then more and more that we manage knowledge workers. Well, knowledge worker knows more about what they're doing than their boss does. So if I manage you and you know more of what you're doing than I do, I can't tell you what to do and how to do it. Why? You know more than me. And you know, if I'm coaching a CEO and they know more about marketing than a marketing person and finance than a finance person, HR than the HR person, they don't have a leadership problem. They got a selection problem. <laughs> they got the wrong staff. If they don't know more than you today, you got the wrong staff. Well, you can't tell them what to do and how to do it. You have to ask, you have to listen, you have to learn. So those are the five things that we came up with. And I have to say from my time here at the school, I mean, if, if the people here in the school are about a tenth as good as those ones I saw, I mean, that's almost frightening how good they were, right? I, I would say that the school is doing a really good job of addressing your question and those issues. So. As we're wrapping up, big round of applause for the school. Yeah. And, and David, they asked you to kind of respond to more. You know, uh, given the, the nature of the work that I do, uh, first of all, I need to find out what's got their attention. That's where I start. What has your attention? And then focusing on outcome. What would you like to have true? Yeah. You know, what's off? What's not on cruise control? What would cruise control look like? And get people to think about outcomes desired outcomes because when people get in the driver's seat of their life they make better choices mm -hmm. they really do and you know i've coached all kinds of people and also one other trend i'll just mention is the self-organizing organizations mm -hmm. that is not going to stop uh, so you're not going to have ceos I've, I've been practicing holacracy for 12 years we have no job titles we have accountability and roles so there's not a hierarchical kind of thing. So I think, you know, that's again, a, it's a micro example mm -hmm. of what, what we may be talking about here, where we all just work together. We don't have, there's no hierarchy. There's a, there's, here's what needs to get done. And it's not Nancy pansy It's quite, it's distributed dictatorship, <laughs> which is actually distributed stress. <laughs> Hi, everybody join me with the problem. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, so much more we could do, but I think our time is up, isn't it? So um, I want to thank, give my panelists a, a hand. Great. Brilliant. And, uh, and I, I think John would have enjoyed this. He probably would have taken a few notes. And, uh, and he would have certainly had a lot to say as well. So, so thank you.